frequency takes people back to their original blueprint. And it awakens something in them that I think sometimes we've forgotten is the root system of who we are. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. So today's episode is about sound, frequency healing, spirituality, undoing our conditioning, and coming back into connection with our soul. I really liked the guest today. Her name is Erin Eber. Erin Eber is an intuitive guide, frequency healer, and human design reader who for almost 20 years has guided people to experience expansion, flow, ease, and inner connection. She supports humans on an awakening journey to effortlessly ground in their divine essence and bring deep and lasting transformations into their lives. Her main modality, frequency healing, is a channeled gift using her voice that she was initiated into through her own healing process and has helped shift thousands of people into an expanded state of consciousness. Hello, Erin. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling today? I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm excited for you to be here too. I was telling you before this call that I found you on TikTok not too long ago and the power of TikTok to just like, like instantly I was like, oh, she's so cool. I have to have her on my podcast. (laughs) It truly is amazing that we have these tools now to like meet people that we may have never met in person before. I just love it so much. And it it just happened so fast. I was like, oh, she's, she's ready to come on the podcast already. Like the fact that you like (laughs) booked a time so soon, I was like, okay, let's do this. (laughs) You know what? It just felt right. I looked at some of your further out times and I just went, no, nah, let's just do it. <laughs> it's yeah. <time." laughs> awesome. Okay. So um, before we get into the interview, you mentioned that you like to kind of set the tone and demonstrate what what you do and what frequency healing is. So I'll give it, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. You know, I could talk about frequency all day long, but I always say the best way to understand it is just to experience it. So I think the really a nice thing to do would be to just bring us all into this moment. So anyone who's listening, you and I, bringing us all here together to sort of ground into whatever the perfect thing for each person listening to take away from our conversation is, whatever the perfect conversations that are meant to come forward today between the two of us can come forward. So I do like to tell people if you're like driving or operating heavy machinery, sometimes it's best to pull over for a second or take a minute. This is going to be a fast um, attunement, but I do think it's better if we can take a minute and close our eyes and truly tune into the frequency and the sound that's coming through. So if we can take a minute to close our eyes and everybody listening can take a minute, you know, it's probably been a hectic day, whatever you've been doing, there's probably been a lot of things happening. So let's just take this minute or two to tune in to the deepest part of ourselves, to call forward our deepest soulful truth and our hearts and exactly the perfect way to show up for yourself right now in this moment might be. And we're going to bring through a couple frequencies to call forward this deepest truth within you, this most authentic and soulful you to be fully present for yourself right now and just allow these sounds to wash through you and we'll leave one moment of silence at the end and I will invite you back after that and we invite these tones and sounds through now
And just let those tones settle into your body, moving and washing through whatever may have arisen during that time. And whenever you're ready, we can come back to the present moment into this conversation. Thank you. That's amazing that that was your voice, that you can do those vibrations. And there was one part where I actually heard like an, a secondary tone come out under. I'm not, I, I don't know. Um, that, that, was, that was cool. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. I often have people tell me the first time I do it with them. They have to open their eyes and look at me because they're like, I wanted was to that, that you making that sound? <laughs> I was like, like, what does she look yeah. like when she's doing this? Well, it looks quite oh. interesting, actually. So, you know, it is kind of fun to watch the videos because I, I shake a lot when I do it and I move my hands a lot. So it does look a little funny. And if you don't, if you're not tuning in or know the context, I'd probably look a little bit weird. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just kind of how it, the channel comes through me. It's like, I just have to, I have to move, uh, with the vibration. Right. Okay. Now I have so many questions about <laughs> that. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay. Um, I, I first want to know, I mean, my first questions are basic. What is frequency healing and how did you get into it? Yeah. So I call what I do frequency healing, um, but it actually, you could probably call it a lot of things. You know, it's vocal frequency channeling. It's, um, you know, it's so many different things. Sometimes I describe it to people as Reiki with my voice um, mm. for sometimes better, you know, lack of a better way to talk about it. But I really organically created this method through my life experience and also my own internal guidance. So I've been a singer since I was a child. It's been something that's just been one of my biggest soul passions for as long as I can remember. And I always knew I was meant to do something with music and sound. And that was very much alive in my soul, but I pursued more traditional roots with it in the beginning. I was really involved in theater and different forms of musical performance. And I started having a lot of vocal problems when I was a teenager. In fact, I lost my voice altogether at one point. And now I know that was from a boatload of trauma, but at the time I did not know that. And so I started looking into alternative healing methods um, to try to get my voice back. And that led me to people that were doing different healing modalities. And ironically, the first person I worked with was a woman who worked with something called a bioresonance machine, which now has become something that's more well known. But 20 years ago, nobody knew what that was, but it works with frequency. Um, through a machine, but still frequency. And she started doing a lot of work with me that was really helping me. And so this woman ended up becoming one of my first mentors. But over the years, I went through many different healing modalities and started exploring healing. It's what opened my spiritual path. It's what opened me to being a healer. But it wasn't until many years later that I was actually at the time living in Guatemala. I was working with cacao as medicine. And I was in a cacao ceremony and the person running it, who was a bit of an intuitive and channeler himself, turned to me and said, Aaron, make a sound. And I was like, what do you mean make a sound? And he just said, just make a sound. I'm being told you need to make a sound. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> okay. So I just made some random sound. It wasn't even anything amazing or interesting. And within minutes, like everyone around me was in tears they were letting things go. There was all this stuff happening, all these things moving. And it sparked something in me that went, oh, there's something here. I'm supposed to be using this in my healing work. And so for many years after that, I would just use it while I did cacao ceremonies. I would use it in my um, various kinds of healing work that I was doing at the time. And then it was about six years ago that I got the message very, very clearly that this needed to be the primary tool that I was using. And the main reason for that is that as a species, we need to move away from only being in the mind, only being in our intellect. And frequency is the language of the body. It's the language of the brain. It's the language of neurons. It's our first language. So when we're babies in the womb, we feel and hear frequency. We don't know what it means. We haven't put together words yet. And so frequency takes people back to their original blueprint. Mm. 
And it awakens something in them that I think sometimes we've forgotten is the root system of who we are. And so I've used the frequency as this way to channel what can't always be said, what can't always be understood, but people can then feel that movement within themselves and feel the awakening within themselves for the truth of who they are to be more present and more there. Mm -hmm. So that is beautiful. It it is true. Frequency is our first language. Everything is a vibration, right? Energy, everything's energy. Everything is that some sort of frequency. Um, I, I mean, going back to your journey, you mentioned you were doing healing work before frequency. So what were you doing then? I was doing more just intuitive energy healing. So I've always been an intuitive and I've always Mm -hmm. been someone who could channel information on a deeper level for people and for myself. So, you know, someone would tell me some very surface level thing that was going on and and immediately I'd be getting messages from their soul about Mm -hmm. maybe what was really going on, like what was going on behind whatever they said. Um, And so that type of work had been with me for as long as I could remember. Ever since you were a child, you kind of felt like you had that gift? I did. And I think I didn't want to admit it for a very long time. I doubted myself a lot until I was Mm. much older. Um, And so it wasn't until I was more in my 20s that I really started going, oh, there's something here. And I would do it even just like with my friends or with people I knew. It wasn't like I was out there so much being like, I'm a healer. Um, I was more just doing it on the down low. Um, And then I was doing work with cacao for a long time. And for me, cacao is a a really beautiful space holder to get people sharing their gifts in the world. And so for me, it was this like partner that kind of came along with me in the beginning and said, you can do this. Like, you know, this is is good. And so that was really training method in a way. Very cool. And let's not brush over cacao for the listeners who don't know what it is and (laughs) how it's used. I've done a cacao ceremony before, but how would you explain that to people who've never heard of anything like this? Well, a cacao ceremony can be so many different things um, because really working with ceremonial grade cacao, so cacao that's come from a really quality source where it's still in its whole form, it's processed minimally so that it maintains most of the active compounds in it, which is a definite type of cacao you have to seek out. You know, it's not like what you're going to go buy in the grocery store. But if you sit with cacao, it will open your own intuitive awareness within yourself. It gets you very in your body. And what I find is that it is a beautiful space holder for people to share their medicine with the world. So if you're a sound healer, very often you'll see cacao and sound. If you're someone who runs dance events, you'll see people do cacao and dance, um, cacao and singing, cacao and sharing. You know, you can see it shared in many different ways. So it helps you get into your body. And what, what was the other part? Um, It can bring you more into your intuition and it moves your emotional body and really just tends to get people out of their head and into their... I see. I see. Okay. So back to you discovering the power of your voice. Um, You mentioned the first time it was like a random sound. Like my big, my question when I'm hearing you do this is like, is this plan? Do you know what frequencies you're going to voice or does it just come to you and you just follow that intuition? It just comes to me. And very often the sounds will sound very similar. Like I have certain tones that I use over and over and over again, but I use them in different um, organizations, you know? So it's similar to like notes on a scale, right? There's only so many of them, but they get used in different ways and you end up making completely different songs. Um, And, you know, the way you use them will create something completely different. So that tends to be how I use it, where it sounds similar, but it's doing different things every time. So you're literally just being the channel, letting the sound flow through you. Because I'm like, where is this coming from? How does she <laughs> like, like, what is the meaning? You know? Well, you know, if if I can get a little bit out there, and I feel like on this, yeah, go for you it. Know, <laughs> this conversation, I can be a little bit out there because I don't tell mm-hmm. necessarily everyone these types of things, but. I definitely feel it comes from another dimension that I feel very connected to. And it took me many years to really understand that and to really integrate that my soul was very connected to other dimensional existences and, you know, essentially star systems of other galaxies. 
And so for me, this particular type of healing felt like I was given a gift from those dimensions and those galaxies. And it told me when it gave it to me, this is a very unique gift that is for you to use. That's very um, connected to who you are. And I think we all have those. And so this is something I love working with people on is like, we've all come here to bring really special, unique gifts from whatever our particular soulful story is. And I really love helping people know that about themselves and trust that about themselves. Yeah. Love it. So like you gave us a little preview of your sound, your frequency healing, but what happens in like a full session? How do you help people? You know, how do you guide people through that healing? Yeah. So a typical session would be the beginning would be more talking because I like to have a conversation and tune into what that person is hoping to gain from our time together, what they are struggling with, what might be on their mind. And from there, I just start intuitively reading those deeper messages from their soul. Sometimes I just give a lot of messages because that's what's being asked. Sometimes it is more of a conversation um, because there are moments where sometimes it needs to come from that person's own knowing as opposed to me telling them. And then all the information just starts gathering in my space. Um, And I start to get to a point where it's like saturated and I go, okay, Mm -hmm. now we have to tone, you know, like this has been enough conversation. It's time to tone. Um, Now it needs to come through, through nonverbal communication. And then usually the person relaxes and we drop in and I'll only tone for about six minutes, usually five or six minutes. And then there's a lot of silence afterwards because I think that's really important for integration as well. And then I record that so that they can tune back into it because it will change over time. Mm -hmm. And something my clients tell me all the time is that every time they listen to it, it's a completely different experience Um, because I always see them as sort of instead of horizontal, like when we talk, it's horizontal communication, but this is vertical communication. So it's like in five minutes, you can drop like a lot into the space. Yeah. I mean, what, when you said like, okay, you, you understand the conversation, basically you said it gets so saturated and then you need to tone. So what is the, I guess, what is that urge? Like what is toning going to do? Is it continuing the conversation or is the toning just like your um, solution? Like here's your medicine, like what, you know? Yeah, I find that a lot of things come in in different ways. And so sometimes there's pieces that want to drop in through the talking. Sometimes there's pieces that want to come in through just presence and silence. And sometimes there's pieces that need the sound. And very Mm -hmm. often I see the sound doing kind of the physical work in the body, um, Mm -hmm. starting to move around things on a more energetic plane and um, helping that person get into their deepest alignment and also opening energetically, like something maybe that came up in the conversation that was ready to open or shift or move. Interesting. Let's get more, like, let's get into that on both the scientific and the energetic and spiritual level. Like what is happening when we're hearing these frequencies? There is really amazing science coming out these days around sound and frequency. And I've been diving into that a lot over the last couple of years. Um, one of them that I find very interesting is the use of high frequency to grow bones from stem cells. And they're finding that this is the most efficient way to grow a bone from a stem cell. And if we know anything about stem cells, they're actually all the same cell, but they grow into different things depending on what they get cultured in, what they get put in. And so I think about this a lot when I do my work because I also study the science of water a lot as well. And the way frequency and sound and vibration affect water, which is a whole different conversation, but that's a big one. And so what I see a lot in the body is the energetics of the plasma and the water cells, which is really the roots of our life in our body, rearranging and reorganizing. And when they do that, the cellular structure of our body can grow and change in any way that we could imagine, because that's literally how we change and grow cells. And it's like something that I've just been sort of piecing together with all these different amazing scientific studies that are being done on these things. But um, there's also a lot of science around Alzheimer's patients and um, the 40 frequency hertz, 
which has been studied um, to show that the 40 frequency hertz can either slow or stop the progression of Alzheimer's in patients. And that's because it's keeping the neurons connected because the frequency works with the neurons. And so there's all these really amazing things that we're seeing come out about the magic of frequency. And I see a lot of those things happening just intuitively when I work with people. Um, Sometimes I'm working directly with the brain. Sometimes I'm working more with the cellular structure within the body. Um, It's a little different depending on every person's needs. Yeah. That is so fascinating. And I, I feel like science has barely scratched the surface of, of the power of frequency and sound. When you talk about water, I mean, I hope the listeners have seen these, whether you've seen the TikTok or just heard about like these water experiments where either they play different types of music to water and it crystallizes in different forms or speaking to water, right? Like positive things, negative things. I think it's both water and plants. I I, I forget, but I, I I've seen... Um, these experiments and just realizing that we are, there's a lot of water in our, in us, in our bodies. Like, like it, it makes sense that we would be affected by sound. Fully. Fully. Yeah. We're yeah. 99% molecularly water actually yeah. like in our bodies. Oh, wow. And, and the fact that I, I think it's empowering to hear you say we can change our bodies at, in whatever way that we want. Cause I think a lot of people don't realize that they, we limit ourselves. Oh, I am this way, or I'm born this way, or I have this issue and it's here forever. Right. So what, what kind of things have you seen or have you helped people heal or change in themselves? Oh, wow. That's such a good question. I'm like yeah. racking back. Like through your my- favorite, I don't know any, any examples. Cause I think the more examples we get, the, the more people can understand. Yeah. And I have so many, so I'm trying to think what's a good one. What's like a really good one. Um, (laughs) You know, it's interesting because I have a lot of clients that have unexpected benefits from their sessions, you know, where we are really there working on one thing, but then something else happens. Um, I had a client actually who was, um, who had a son who was autistic um, and we did atoning for him because he was having some behavioral issues. And so, and he likes sound. So she thought he might respond to it. And she told me that he plays it every night to go to sleep. Like it's Aww. the one thing that calms him down and has him go to yeah. sleep and be, and feel centered and calm. Um, I have another client who, um, she was overdue about to give birth and we did atoning to initiate the birth. <laughs> And that was actually pretty wild. She literally went into labor like 20 <gasps> minutes after the toning. Um, oh my you know, god! You don't want to mess the around. Like I hear like you. That. I'm ready. <laughs> well, you know, the baby had a lot that wanted to happen before it was born, and I was given a lot of those messages about oh certain things energetically that the baby wanted to have in place in order to wow. come in. Um, that was, you know, that baby's a very powerful soul, so it was telling me a lot of things. Um, Another good example is like I have a client with a um, neurodegenerative disorder that's um, very debilitating and painful. And so we do um, tonings that he tells me stop his pain almost completely. Mm. But, you know, those are the types of things that I do hesitate to make claims about because I think everyone's yeah. unique. Exactly. You know, I think, you I think I promise anything. Or, yeah. Right. I think especially with body health, it's so complicated. There's so many layers to it. Um, mm-hmm. but I have found that it can be incredibly, um, transformational for people. The main feedback that I get from a lot of my clients is that they didn't realize healing could be easy. Like a lot of people who work with me have been doing healing work for a lot of years and working very, very hard at it, you know, and very committed, um, as we are. And, um, and then I kind of like to introduce that, you know, sometimes we can open these effortless doorways that will bring in really miraculous shifts and changes in ways we might not have anticipated. So... Yeah, that's really nice to hear because I think when people think about healing, it's like a difficult process. You're getting into ugly parts, which, you know, that there is a time and place for those experiences as well. But the fact that this 
like, is, is it mostly passive on the listener and all they have to do is listen and that's it? <laughs> yes, exactly. I say all you have to do is receive and allow. Right. Sometimes uncomfortable things I think come up for people. They tell me that there are certain tones that will like start moving things in their body that they're like, oh, this is uncomfortable. But I always tell people by the end, you should feel neutral and you usually will. Like you'll get to that point towards the end of the toning where you're like, oh, okay, that calmed down. Um you know, because it does move things sometimes. It does move emotions. It does move old stories and, and yeah. old things. So, I mean, do you have sort of like, how do you guide people after the, the session? Do, are there things that they're supposed to do or, or are you just, you know, just live your life and like it'll naturally heal itself? I really recommend people to tune back into the frequency recording at least daily or as often as they can for as long as it feels alive. That's what I always tell people. And then oh. I say, you know, and then you may need to come in for another one, you know, but because <laughs> sometimes it's like that's complete, whatever that part of it is. Um, but it's really interesting. I, I do try to just trust people to feel into what's going to be right for them in that capacity. So I have some people that work with me every week. And then I have other people that tune in with me like twice a year, you know, like just for tune ups. <laughs> so everybody's kind of different. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. With so many distractions around us, it's essential to take care of our minds. Our mental health shapes how we feel about ourselves and our lives. That's why I pay close attention to how I'm nurturing my mind so that I can feel clear and at peace, or at the very least, okay, regardless of what's happening on the outside. Some of my go-tos are meditation, journaling, exercise, and BetterHelp Online Therapy. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is having a therapist will help you tap into deeper emotions and fears, ones that you don't notice in your day to day. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. If you're interested in trying it out, our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash TLL. That's betterhelp.com slash TLL. Another thing I'm curious about is how do you know which frequencies are healing? Are there certain frequencies that are more healing than others? Like you mentioned, you have certain favorite ones that you go back to. 40 hertz is an example. So what makes them he more healing? You know, that's a great question. 40 hertz in particular, they say, is the frequency of a brainwave. And so I think that's part of why that's healing. In my sound, I do think there's multiple frequencies going on at one time. As you said, you know, you kind of heard some. Yeah. And so I just trust that it's coming through the way it's supposed to come through. You know, it's just how I've been sort of guided to do it. And I see that it works. So I just do that, you know, but I've always been kind of curious to have somebody sort of like study the frequencies I'm doing just to, you know, get more. Right. Like why are certain ones used more than others? Because, you know, I've heard of like binaural beats or all these like YouTube videos of different frequencies, but I've always wondered like, why, why this one <laughs> out of all the frequencies? Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. I think some of it is actually probably not even that accurate. You know, exactly. like I think it, like some you of just it makes is, us up. <laughs> yeah, I, to be honest, yeah, you know, I think some of it is, you know, you uh -huh. hear certain things and it's in, interesting to look into the history of why someone decided that's the frequency of blah, 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 you know, because usually it isn't like scientifically backed or anything, especially like some of these frequencies of miracles or frequencies of whatever. But I do think that all frequencies have something that is important and unique. And there probably are some that resonate with the heart, resonate resonate, mm. you know, with the solar plexus, resonate with the brain waves, you know, there's, there's these different sounds and tones that will work with different parts of the body. So I think that that also does have truth to it. Um, but also like if you're listening to, you know, five, whatever every day and you're like, I don't feel anything, then, you know, it's, <laughs> maybe it's not for you, <laughs> you know, that one. You know what? I, when you talked about like the feeling it in different parts of your body, then it kind of made more sense. Cause like higher frequencies, you might heal, feel like up here or, and then lower frequencies, you feel it like lower in your body. So depending Definitely. on the, you know, the pitch that could activate a different part. I'm just guessing. Definitely. <laughs> and I have yeah. a very low frequency that I use in my sessions that is, um, it almost has like a didgeridoo feeling to me. 
Um, but that frequency is the one that I'm always guided to do when I'm working with, um, people's sort of like karmic storylines or their root system, um, of their energetic body, um, here on the planet. Um, something that I call kind of the existential chakra, um, which is often sort of like how much people really want to be here, which can be a little bit dicey for a lot of people. Um, and I find that that low tone is what comes through when I'm doing that kind of work. Um, that's Mm -hmm. usually what I'm shown. So, Mm -hmm. and I'm curious about your experience too. Like, what are you experiencing in your body and soul while you're doing these tones? Yeah, for me, it just feels really good. Like in the same way that I love to sing, it just feels really good. Like it feels like, yes, this is, you know, like this is what you want to be doing right now. And then afterwards, I always feel great as well. Like I, I actually, this was a prayer of mine many years ago because when I was doing energy work, like over 10 years ago, it would sometimes feel draining and I would come out of it feeling like kind of drained and having to replenish. And I had this awareness that that probably meant something wasn't quite right in the work that I was doing. And so I actually had sort of a prayer that I figure out how to do healing work in a way, like I'll only do this if there's a way for it to feel as good to me as it feels to the people that I'm working with. And as soon as I started doing the frequency work, I was like, oh, this is it. You know, like I feel so good when I do this. It charges me up so much. Oh, that's beautiful. I like, that's something everybody, I hope everyone can find something like that. Something that makes you feel good and give you energy rather than deplete your energy. 100%. And I work with very sensitive people and empaths a lot on this because that's so common that empaths just give and give and give. And then like (laughs) you have nothing left. So it's important. Yeah. You mentioned that you're basically what you do is to help someone tap into their soul and connect more with their soul. I I mean, I just threw this question on here. In your definition, what is the soul? That's like my favorite question. I know. I feel like you would like this. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It's like weird how excited that makes me. Um (laughs) No, you know, it's funny because I was called to throw that on there. And I was like, this is so, you know, I wouldn't ask this to everyone, but I feel like you would like this one. <laughs> it was very intuitive of you to ask me this. Um, Thank you. No, you know, I went on a very deep journey with myself in my late 20s, early up until my early 30s, where it was this sort of like, I call it kind of like the death of the soul that I was. Um I felt that I sort of went through this like decomposing process that was very, very painful for me. Um, But when I finally stopped, as I call it, bouncing on rock bottom with that, I came out in this space where I felt like I was in the most expansive space I'd ever been in in my life, the most peaceful space I'd ever been in in my life. And in that space, I watched my soul get kind of reborn within me. So I watched like, what it looked like to me from my sort of mind's eye was that this new light grid was installed within my body. And so what that sort of taught me was that our souls are sort of like the intermediary world between nothingness and somethingness. And it's when this light, you know, we kind of have this world of nothingness that turns into essence, that turns into light, that turns into energy. And as it's going from something to, you know, to be presented in human form as we are, the first step is this sort of dynamic light grid that gets created that each person's is wildly unique. No one person's soul is the same. And it's obviously all from the same source of light. And yet it expresses totally differently in each person. And so watching this light grid come into full dynamic expression within myself, I started to learn like, oh, this is our soul, you know, and, and then there's sort of this personification of that, that comes out of that, you know, sort of like the best human expression of that light grid, which everybody also has. And so, yeah, when I tune into people, I tend to go to that light grid because within a lot of us, it's been sort of dampened or um, hidden or, you know, like put into little boxes and in, in dark corners, you know, <laughs> we don't yeah. want to let it out all yeah. the way. So when you say light grid, is it 
like, where did you get that? Is it, was it a visual or something that, like, can you explain that a little more? Yeah. So like what the soul could be. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I know words are just so limiting. I get a lot of imagery of things. That's one of Mm -hmm. the main ways that I get information. And so that imagery was every time I would tune into myself during that time period, I just sort of saw empty space. Um, But then all of a sudden, one day that empty space started glowing with like fuzzy light. And then all of a sudden, the fuzzy light started looking almost like a motherboard of a computer, you know, Mm -hmm. where it was like, there was like, um, laser lights kind of like coming out of it. Um, And then all of a sudden, it went into like a much more dynamic, like uh, the lights being more direct and um, laser like. And so I went, oh, okay, my soul's come back on board. (laughs) (laughs) The energy is back for your soul. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. But I notice people, this happens a lot when people go through really big rebirths in their life is that I'll watch the light start to get a little bit dimmer, you know, and then a lot of times people start going through really hard times or things get really difficult. Um, But really it's because it's going back to the motherboard to be sort of recreated into something Mm, new. And then it will eventually come back online. Right. And you said everyone's soul is wildly different, even though, yes, it's all from the same source. So how do you weave, I mean, what are, how do, how do we recognize what makes us wildly different? How do we recognize what our souls are? You know, I think that is a really going to be a different answer for like everyone in a way, you know, but ultimately I always say it is about unwinding a lot of the things that we've been taught that don't feel right to us and owning and stepping into what we innately know to be true about ourselves. And I find that underneath the layers of conditioning, almost everyone does. They know that. They know who they are deep down, even if we've been trained to forget for the millions of reasons that we get trained to forget. And it's almost like that's a little bit of the agreement that we make when we come to this planet. Like, okay, we're going to forget who we are. And then we're going to spend, you know, our whole lives getting back to that in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, And remembering that we are divinity at our core, remembering that our life is sacred, that we're worthy, that we deserve, you know, all, all of the magic in the world. And it's one of those things that can sound a little hokey, but when we truly uncover that within ourselves, it's like you can never forget it. You know, it's it's been seen. And now it's, you can't pretend that's not a thing anymore. So I think people often, it's just about trusting what feels right to you and following those breadcrumbs of what innately feels in alignment and right for you. And for whatever reason, that is one of the hardest things for human beings to do. <laughs> It's what you said. We have so much conditioning. We have a lot of limiting beliefs. There's just, it's a lot of the things that it's a a journey that takes a lifetime to understand and unravel. But that's, I think that's part of why we're here is to experience that and learn and grow through that. Yeah, definitely. It's like all a big experiment in a way, (laughs) you know, to really own that, you know, knowing at the end of the day. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm curious for you, like, it, because we live in this chaotic world, there's a lot of things going on. Like you said, a lot of conditioning or this or that. What do you focus on, like in your life with your values? You know, what do you focus on to to stay grounded and kind of keep that inner peace or connection to your soul? I think being in service is my number one focus these days, because I find that if I can remember that that's the reason I'm doing everything I do and the reason why I'm here, then everything else tends to fall into place. Um, But I also, you know, try to remember, you know, the value of joy and play. That's very important to me. Um, I had a lot of years in my life where I was way too serious. And so, you know, when I sort of rediscovered joy, that became like a top value. (laughs) my life. Yeah. And, um, you know, life is about experience. And so everything that happens in my life to me is a learning and a growth experience. Um, 
you know, no matter what it seems like, no matter what story I might tell myself about it, everything that comes to me is, is a gift. And Mm -hmm. that can be a tough one for people because I know there's a lot of circumstances in the world that are really awful and, um, unjustified and just terrible situations. Um, but I personally have found that my life is a lot more fruitful and productive when I approach it from trusting what is unfolding or what is occurring. And I can also then get a lot more centered in right responses when I approach things that way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do want to touch on, like I, you talked about it on TikTok, how you lived abroad and then you came back now to the U S because you felt like you wanted to help Westerners heal from our culture and the traumas it created. Can you go deeper into that? Why? Like, you talk about, you know, it's all part of this conditioning, the lies that we're told. Yeah. Let's get into that. Yeah. Well, I ended up living out of the country pretty much most of the last 10 years of my life. And that was something I did almost just out of necessity. I was so um, unhappy and depressed when I left the U S and all I knew was I needed to go be in other places and I needed to learn from those places and, and see the world and expand my viewpoint. And it changed me, you know, forever. And I have come in and out of the U.S. Uh, many times over the last 10 years. So I wasn't um, gone the whole time. But the last two and a half years during COVID, I was living in Thailand um, and I ended up there sort of by accident. Thailand is a place that I've been many times and I love and I consider a home. Um, but I went there in March of 2020 thinking I would just go for a month. And I ended up obviously not leaving um, right. during COVID. And something I realized during that time, because I, I do everything intuitively. And so my intuition told me to stay. And then eventually my intuition told me, you're going to go back to the US because that's where you're supposed to be mostly working with people. And so I kind of prepped myself for that. And for about four months, I was like, okay, I'm going to go back. I got to work through this, you know, <laughs> I just really want to come back. Yeah. And um, eventually I felt ready. Um, but there was a big culture shock when I landed. And, um, you know, something that kept coming to me was even what I mentioned earlier about frequency. And I said in stem cells, they grow into different things depending on their culture. And I think about this a lot with the culture that we've been brought up in, the cultures that we've been exposed to, they will affect us because we've literally been cultured in them. And something that really changed for me when I was able to live in a culture that wasn't my own, I watched how much I changed. I watched how my nervous system changed, my body changed, um, what was important to me changed. And I was really aware of how little of that most people get. And so while I know not everybody is going to be able to live out of the country or go immerse themselves in another culture, my hope with this realization is that I can bring something new to the culture of my birth and I can support other people in reculturing themselves. Because the more of us that do this, the more we're going to bring that magic to the collective and eventually shift the collective mindset. So, yeah. Can you talk about the biggest things that we have to unlearn as people from the US or just Westerners in general? Oh my gosh, there's like so this many. This culture. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Please, yeah. please go for yeah. it. Well, you know, I think that um, it's really important to A, learn accurate history, which I think we do not, right? You know, we learn a very whitewashed version of history. Um, a very male-centric version of history, um, a very colonized version of history. And I think it's really important that we unlearn that and learn proper history. So that's one thing that I would say is very important. And we have more resources for that than ever in today's day and age, which is awesome. Um, But I think also the effects of capitalism have been um, wildly under-discussed because I do think that There are ways in which our capitalistic mindset has ripped all of us from the truth of what is sacred. And indigenous cultures and ancient cultures 
they maintained their connection to the sacred through their practices, through their stories, through their culture. And modern American culture has not had that focus. And you see where that's gotten us through a lot of the extreme religious ideologies and through even the new age wellness world to me is heavily influenced by capitalism and white supremacy. And we don't talk about that enough. And, you know, it's so embedded in all of us to go, 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 that our work, the, our work is our value. Um, this idea of scarcity um, and this idea of hyper individualism, which has taken us out of community care and community connection. And all of those things are things that I think need to be talked about more because what I see us having is a crisis of lack of inner connection and lack of connection to life. And that's playing out in a way that is actually going to really end up killing us in the end if we're not, if we don't change that. Um, and you see that with the environmental crisis and also the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat each other. So these are yeah. huge, huge things. Yeah. That it, it, it's hard because it's, it is the culture that we grew up in. I think more and more people are recognizing that it hasn't been healthy. Like we've neglected so many things. We've neglected our souls. We've ne neglected nature. We've neglected like community. Right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, where, where do you think we need to start as the listener on an individual level? Well, I think two places. I mean, I think one, what I said before about all of us need to sort of relearn history and mm -hmm. finding resources for that is, I think, really, really important from like a logical mental level. I think that's really important because even though I come from the level of the soul with a lot of things, the psyche matters and we do need to mm -hmm. like understand those, those pieces. But also I think going on our own individual healing journeys of our own traumatic um, responses is honestly one of the most responsible things anyone can do because every single one of us has trauma and has um, conditionings. And the more of us that are humbly showing up to shifting those things within ourselves, um, the better our world is going to be because it just brings more compassion and more understanding for all of us to actually hear each other and trust each other um, because we have a very hard to time doing that if we haven't looked within to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that going on your own personal healing journey um, and staying open and not ever thinking we've gotten to a place where we have all the answers because I think that can really backfire on us. Um, and then also, you know, taking that time to really learn. Um, I think all of those things are very helpful. Yeah, I think that was, I agree completely. You touched on something that I want to ask you a little bit more about was the, how like new age spirituality and wellness is very whitewashed and capitalistic, right? Yeah. Um, go into that. I, I think <laughs> we're starting to recognize that more and more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that became very apparent during the QAnon rise. Um, it had been there for a long time and it had been something that I'd been watching and sort of confused by for a long time because, you know, the way I got into the healing world was not through mainstream spirituality or wellness. And so for many years of my life, the only people I knew in that world were either like in their 60s or maybe a little bit quirky or, you know, <laughs> not... Yeah not like beautiful, perfect people on Instagram, right? Like that wasn't the world of spirituality that I knew. And so it wasn't until I was in my late twenties and I started traveling and living abroad and being in communities that were of seekers. Um, I started seeing this other side of the spiritual world where it was, it was a little bit, um, I call it sort of adolescent spirituality. It's like when you first get into spirituality and you're still approaching it from kind of like your wounding and the things that maybe haven't been looked at or dealt with yet. And that's a very normal stage of growth that occurs. But unfortunately, because this is the US and now we have, you know, social media as this tool, 
that stage blew up into like the biggest thing that anyone was seeing was kind of what I started to notice. And so, you know, there are a lot of people out there that um, are not trauma informed or um, are approaching things from a space of wanting to control people or just have all the answers. And um, they get a lot of attention is what I find. And so, you know, what became sort of the world of spirituality that was getting the most um, airtime was the ones that were really good at marketing or really knew how to hook people, you know, with fear or with all these different things. So, you know, and then I think what you have is a crisis going on in the U.S. where a lot of people just feel so lost and they feel so disconnected from themselves that they will look to, you know, whatever seems to be helping. So, you know, if yoga was helping, you go to yoga or if meditation was helping, go to meditation. But a lot of us aren't around these things long enough to know that so many of those things are also being used in ways that are appropriating from other cultures or, um, you know, not um, honoring or giving back to the original traditions that they came from. So, you know, I think it just sort of has gotten really out of hand and, um, Thankfully, I see more and more people talking about it. I see it becoming a more common discussion than it was like four or five years ago, which I'm really grateful for um, because there are so many great healers out there. And I really hate to see the healing industry get a bad name, you know, through some of the things that have been used in ways that aren't so great. Right, right. And w- there are so many different like angles to this. Like one is the, like you said, there are some people that, you know, they thrive on marketing to people's fears and their traumas and they take advantage of it. It's like, they say they're trying to heal you, but really they're just trying to sell you something <laughs> it, that that is amassed as healing. So that's something to watch out for. And then another part is this um, idealized, beautiful version of spirituality and wellness, like the goops and the, you have to have, <laughs> I, yeah, like there's like a, I don't know, like yes. it wasn't accessible. <laughs> <laughs> it, like it wasn't accessible to everybody. It was, mm-hmm. it just was another box. And it's, yeah, I, I'm glad that we're talking about this more. Like, I think, yeah, I think we were still at the very beginning as, as an American culture at the beginning of like understanding spirituality and wellness. And it's even with things like yoga and taking things from other cultures, like it almost seems like since, since you're taking it from another culture, you're only, you only know a fragment. And when you share that, it becomes an even smaller fragment. And then it kind of, it distills into something that is not what it was supposed to be in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's that, that we have to work on. It's, yeah, it has become a little bit messy. And, and Mm -hmm. what I think is kind of the, not like the answer, but what I see as sort of the current solution is that, you know, we continue to find ways to tap into our own inner source and inner divinity in, you know, ways that feel aligned for us, you know, because I think that we do rely on, tools or things outside of ourselves, maybe a bit too much as humans, you know, and, um, and, you know, I think that there's so much inner healing work that can be done that does not, you know, tap into some of those more unhealthy wellness um, worlds. So yeah, I think there are paths forward. I just think, unfortunately, it has also turned into something that's become a bit toxic in a mass scale. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, it's, I think that's part of the journey as well. <laughs> it's going through the ugly parts. It's never, it wasn't going to be perfect, <laughs> but yeah. I, what's a nice reminder is what you said is like, we have that power within us. We don't really need to find our healing from anything external. Like all the answers like we have. So yes. It's sort of like that proverb that's like, don't look at the finger pointing to the moon, look at the moon. And I feel like that's a big thing that we forget on the spiritual journey, you know, is it's really common to see people give their power away. And it's something that I think we all go through in the reclaiming of our own source and our own power. Um, But I think that 
you know, that's where a lot of the toxicity has been able to get in is that, you know, people do sometimes coerced or convinced to give their power away for various reasons. And so, um, you know, just remembering your own innate power and that ultimately at the end of the day, you really know what's best for you and you know yourself better than anyone else, um, I think is really important on this journey. Yeah. Um, moving forward, um, what advice do you want to share with our listeners? Um, how do you want to guide them in terms of like connecting with their soul and, and moving forward with their spirituality journey? I think, first of all, just remembering that that source and that aliveness is available within you, even if you're not feeling it yet. Um, it can be a little bit of a journey and an unwinding to come into that wholeness within yourself and feeling that connection. But I guess I just want people to know that it is possible because, you know, I think I had a lot of years in my life where I really questioned, is it even possible? Um, you know, I was so depressed and I really, what kind of kept me going was having teachers and guides that I saw were very connected and tapped into something bigger than their human selves. And when I saw that in action and I felt that by being around them, I was given hope to keep going. You know, I was like, oh, okay, like there is a bigger experience of life. I'm just not quite there yet. And so I think if anybody is on that path and that journey, you know, just remembering that it is available and it is there. And um, like I said earlier, to trust those breadcrumbs of your life and where you're led to the right people and to the right circumstances and situations that will open that for you. Yeah. Um, Because I think we don't ask for help enough. That's actually something that I see in a lot of people um, is just like remembering to that the universe is working with you all the time. And you can literally just ask for things. You can ask for help. You know, you can say like, Hey, I'm really trying to figure this out. Like, please guide me to, you know, the right situations or the right answers, the right people. Um, and sometimes that's all it takes. It's actually pretty wild. So, yeah. Is that something that you do often? Like, what is your relationship with the universe? Like, since you're more intuitive and tapped into that, like how, what is that experience like? Yeah, I do a lot to stay connected to like the depths of myself. I, I try to take enough time to be in silence and meditation that I get that recharge like every day. Cause I find that that's where a lot of my recharge comes from. And, um, and a lot of where my answers come from actually is if I just like shut my mind down. Um, I actually also read human design, which is a total side note, but I, in human design, one of my favorite things about that is that they say that answers never come from the mind, (laughs) you know, like every single type's intuition comes from something other than the mind. And I think that's so helpful to remind people of because, we always think we're going to solve things with the mind and really often the answers come in, in other types of ways that we're not expecting. Um, but I, I do, um, like I said earlier as well, I, I try to be in trust with my life and, you know, I can of course have moments where lots of feelings come up or lots of things surface. Um, and then I just go back to the drawing board and, tune back in and say, all right, so what now? You know, like I got led here for a reason. What now? And um, I find that really interesting things unfold that oftentimes I could never have predicted. (laughs) Yeah. Love it. I'm curious, what is your human design type? (laughs) I'm a manifesting generator with emotional authority. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. I love and, yeah, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> it is. That's like a whole yeah. other can of worms we don't need to open today. Yeah. But um no, I, I do feel that emotional authority within myself. I, I watch myself ride emotional waves all the time. So um that's one of the things I love with human design. It just gives people another lens to look at something through and go like and relate to and understand themselves with. So yeah. Amazing. Okay, um, where can we find you online? So I'm on TikTok at Frequency Portal, and I am on Instagram as my name, Erin Eber. And then my website is erinebercom 
Um, and actually my newsletter has a frequency healing meditation. So you can do a full experience frequency meditation. Um, if you sign up for my newsletter and then, you know, I try not to spam people with emails. I just like to keep you posted on things I'm doing events I'm doing or, um, different kinds of offerings that I'm putting out. So that's the best way to stay in touch. Okay. Yes. I'll definitely link all that in the show notes. And I really like your name frequency portal. Like it's, it fits you perfectly. <laughs> like you said, you're literally a portal between dimensions and bringing in a frequency from somewhere, somewhere we don't know where, but yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, love it. I like it too. I like to think like, you know, when people work with me, they're entering into the frequency portal. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Erin. Um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>